this, 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 this show is brought to you by Safety FM. What's up, peeps? Welcome back to Rebranding Safety. Today, we are going to be doing a new segment called Rebranding Safety Reacts, where we're going to take a news story, something on social media, comment, post, whatever it is, video maybe, old, new, something that we've seen or people are talking about, and we're going to react to it. So we're going to make this a monthly thing. So hopefully, as it develops and as we get into it, um, all of you peeps as listeners will go, hey, I really want to hear what James and Rebound Safety have got to say about that. And, um, you know, hey, we might even get you on as well and talk about it with us. Uh, but ultimately, if you see something you want to hear us talk about, waffle on, give opinion on, then send it over to us for this new segment called Rebound and Safety React. So let's jump into the intro and we get into today's React. The problem in safety isn't deviation, it's complexity. Health and safety has gone mad. Health and safety is trying to unpick having gone mad in the past. There's no one solution and one problem. The problem is that we are looking for one solution. Does the structure of the team allow them to flourish? Feel safe enough to be uncomfortable. The environment defines our behaviours. People aren't the problem, they're the solution. Rebranding safety, crushing a stereotype. Brought to you by Risk Fluid. What's up peeps, welcome back to Rebranding Safety. Rebranding Safety is a YouTube channel and podcast doing exactly what it says on the tin we're here to change the perception of health and safety so if you're new here hit subscribe and all those algorithm butter me thingy me jiggies so today we're going to react to two news stories and we're going to use those news stories to talk about blame and organizational learning in the workplace can you believe we're still talking about blame nowadays um, and we still haven't got our head around it well clearly there's lots to talk about here. Clearly, it's not as simple as the new platitude that we all talk about, which is no blame, which I'll talk about platitudes later on. Um, but we're going to talk about the Croydon tram crash, um, where they are now where they are now prosecuting the driver of that uh, crash. And we're going to talk about the nurse in the US whose medical error caused the death of a patient, and she's also being prosecuted as well. So let me give you some context then to both of these. Sources for the Croydon tram crash is the ever-reliable Wikipedia. So if things in here aren't overly correct, then you can go to Wikipedia. But we'll put uh, stuff in the show notes so you can go and check it all out yourself as well. Um, and we're not really going to get too much into the case. We're just going to present the case as a kind of framework for our conversation around blame um, and how these cases are ultimately going to impact the conversation around blame and how they could impact you as well um, when you're trying to do um, stuff in your workplace around organisational learning or just culture or something like that as well, of which I know quite a few people are uh, doing that stuff now. Um, the US nurses case, most of the stuff there uh, is sourced from uh, general journalism. Uh, NPR was one of the main uh, ones and ABC was the second one. So again... Um, not the most reliable of sources, but ultimately a source nonetheless. Okay, so Croydon tram crash then. So the crash itself was in November 2016. It was operated by Tramlink. It derailed and overturned on a sharp bend approaching a junction. Um, there were 69 passengers. Um, there were seven fatalities. 62 of, them, of the people on the tram were injured, 19 of whom um, sustained serious injuries. And it was the first tram incident um, in which fatalities were had since 1959. A 42-year-old tram driver was arrested by the British Transport Police on suspicion of manslaughter, but after questioning, he was released back in May 17. In October 2019, the British Transport Police and the CPS announced that neither the driver, operating company or TfL would face prosecution. CPS stated that whilst there was evidence of negligence by the driver, it did not count as gross, and so manslaughter by gross negligence could not apply. Prosecutors also stated that because of the section of tramway where the crash happened was neither legally a railway nor a public place and various other potential offences would not apply either. In April 17, uh, Victoria Derbyshire uh, show reported its own investigation into drivers falling asleep at the controls of the trams uh, revealed four such cases. Six drivers claimed that the dead man's vigilance device fitted to the trams was not fit for purpose. Uh, Tramlink responded to that. They said that they were fully functional. The Office for Rail and Road opened its own investigation into the accident, concentrating on whether or not safety rules were followed. It confirmed that the British trams were um, not fitted 
uh, sorry, they confirmed that British trams are not fitted with an overspeed protection device. The ORR was expected to make an announcement about its investigation early 2018. Uh, on the third anniversary of the accident, the ORR tweeted that its investigation was ongoing. At the time of the accident, it was dark and it was raining heavily. There was no evidence of any defects on defects on the track uh, or obstructions on the track that could have contributed to the derailment. The tram was travelling at approximately 60 kilometres per hour at the time of the accident, which is reported to be far exceeding the speed restriction. In April 2017, it was reported that there had been three cases of speeding on the section of line, which included the accident site in the period... Um, Sorry, three cases in a period between November 16 and April 17, um, which included the accident site. In one case, the tram was reported to be travelling at 64 kilometres per hour in a 40 kilometre per hour zone. The final report issued on 7th of December 2017 driver error was found to be the cause of the accident the most likely scenario being that the driver had a micro sleep episode approaching the bend 15 recommendations were made off the back of that and on march the 24th 2022 the orr the office of rail and road announced that it was to prosecute the driver of the tram the tram operations um company called tram operations limited transport for london and transport for london over the accident the driver is charged with failure to take reasonable care of passengers the companies are both charged with failure to ensure the health and safety of passengers on the trolling tram link network so far as reasonably practicable so a lot hell of a long journey there massive long legal process as you know these things don't um don't happen quick um and and that's that's probably a good thing um but ultimately it's quite a messy story and there's lots of context there and like i say we're not going to get into the case itself and issue an opinion on the case at all but i wanted to kind of put out a couple of interesting things there um just to kind of give some context and so you know what we're talking about okay so the U.S. nurse case then was basically a nurse that made a medical error is what is quoted in all of the news stories as a medical error. So we'll, we'll refer to it as that to make sure we're consistent. Um, and I hope I'm pronouncing the lady's name right, uh, but it looks like it's Rhonda Vaught. Uh, she was essentially a former nurse and is criminally prosecuted for the fatal drug error in 2017. Uh, been convicted of gross negligence um, of an impaired adult and negligent homicide. I believe that is a US legal term. Um, she faces three to six years in prison for neglect and one to two years for neglect, for neglect homicide as a defendant with no prior convictions. Medical errors are generally handled by the professional licensing board or the civil courts and, pr and criminal prosecutions like this case are exceedingly rare. In the wake of Murphy, who was the patient who had passed, and they referred to as Murphy's, in the wake of Murphy's death, Vanderbilt, which is the hospital where um, the incident happened, took several actions that resulted in the medication error not being disclosed to the government or the public, according to county, state and federal records related to the death. Vanderbilt also fired Vaught who's a nurse, and negotiated an out-of-court settlement with Murphy's family that bars them from publicly discussing the death. The error was revealed months later when an anonymous tip alerted the Centers for Medicare and Medic, Medic Aid Services and the Tennessee Department of Health, the health department which also alerted the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, TBI, which began its criminal investigation. Murphy, the patient, was prescribed a sedative called Versed to calm her before being scanned in a large MRI-like machine. Vaught was tasked with to retrieve Versed from a computerized medication cabinet, but instead grabbed a powerful paralyzer called Vecu... I can ne I'm not going to be able to say this, but it, it basically it looks like vecuronium. According to an investigation report filed in her court case, the nurse overlooked several warning signs as she withdrew the wrong drug, including that Verse is a liquid, but vecuronium is a powder. Vanderbilt's 
pharmacy medication safety officer testified that the hospital had had some technical problems with medication cabinets in 2017, but that they were resolved weeks before Vought pulled the wrong drug from Murphy. For Murphy, sorry. Vought initially tried to withdraw Verse from the cabinet by typing VE into its search function without realizing she would have been looking for she should have been looking for its generic name which was again a complicated thing to pronounce but it's midazolam midazolam basically verse has two names when the cabinet did not produce verse vort triggered an override that unlocked a much larger selection of medications and then searched for ve again this time the cabinet offered the paralyzer which was vericuronium Prosecutors described this override as a reckless act and a foundation for Vought's reckless homicide charge. Vought insisted in her testimony before the nursing board last year that overrides were common at Vanderbilt, which is a hospital, and that a 2017 upgrade to the hospital's electronic health record system was causing rampant delays at medication cabinets. The ABC uh, news article on this also said that there was no scanner for image for the imaging area for Vought to scan the medication against the patient's ID bracelet. So again, very complex. General kind of feel of that feels like there's quite a lot of political stuff going in, on in there as well. Um, but that's pretty much everywhere, isn't it? But ultimately, quite a tense. Um, kind of situation, tense and complex situation, which when we have tense and complex situations that are under high pressure and, you know, medical cases have been used in human organisational performance as examples of kind of error traps for years, um, particularly with all of these really complex names for drugs, they're, they're just full of error traps, left, right and centre. So we can see all of this stuff here. Now, again, we're not really going to talk about the cases themselves. Might touch on on little bits and bobs, but it, essentially we're using this to frame our conversation around Brahm. Like I say, I am not issuing any kind of opinion on the case, whether one is right or one is wrong. Um, that's for the courts to decide. There's nothing to do with me. And obviously, in the subsequent conversations that we may or may not have off the back of this on LinkedIn or Twitter or anything else, um, off the back of listening to this podcast, we will just need to remember to be respectful that there are people that have lost their lives um, and families that have lost loved ones off the back of this. But ultimately, these cases will have an impact on you and your workplace. And when we're trying to talk about learning and organisational learning, becoming a learning organisation or having a just culture or however or whatever kind of label you want to put on that, cases like this will, will inevitably at least raise questions and spark conversations, which ultimately a good thing. We want to have conversations. We want to improve. We want to learn. Um, but it could have kind of cultural impacts as well. So where do we kind of go from here then? Well, ultimately, when we've talked about just culture or we've talked about a learning organisation, we've never really said that they're, we're removing blame altogether. Well, at least... I don't think that was the intention. Whilst there are platitudes like no blame, which we will talk about in a bit, ultimately blame exists. So I can't really talk for US law because I've never worked in it. I don't know anything about it. But in the UK law, you know, we've we've never not had a legal uh, legal accountability for one's actions. Whether you're a company or an individual within a company, you have a responsibility. Section 7 of the Health and Safety of Work Act makes it very clear. You have to take reasonable care for health and safety of yourselves and others um, who may be affected by your acts or omissions at work. And you have regard to any duty or requirement opposed, imposed onto uh, your employer or any other person by or under any of the re relevant statutory positions to cooperate with them so far as necessary to enable that duty or requirement to be performed or complied with. So what does that mean? Basically... Don't fuck around at work so you can hurt yourself or someone else and make sure you cooperate with the employer and anyone else that's doing things in the name of managing their health and safety obligations, right? So, 
you have a duty. So if you have a legal duty, then there is accountability off of the back of that. There is potential culpability off the back of that. Essentially, there is a, a option for you to be blamed by the courts for not um, for not kind of following your legal duty, right? So it exists. Always has existed. It never hasn't exist. But ultimately, the argument is, is it helpful when we blame within the workplace? And that's, I think, is the important thing here accountability legal accountability 100 percent does exist but it for me exists in the courts right it's for the courts to deal with whether you have breached that or not now there is some form of blame and accountability that will exist within the organization within your kind of legal contract and your performance so like performance managing somebody again i don't really think this is for the safety profession to deal with I think, if anything, that's more of a HR issue. That's what HR is there for, to manage those processes and to stick to the the contract that you're employed to. You have a duty, you've signed a contract, so therefore it falls into contract laws. You have a duty to follow that contract. If that contract says you'll do this and you'll do that and you don't agree with it, then you need to go through the process to do it. You can't just not follow it, right? So... Blame exists whether we like it or not. 100% you can be blamed for not doing what it says in a contract, for not doing what it says in the law. Um, HR slash management slash operations will go through a disciplinary process for doing that wrong. Be that right or wrong, the reasons for which you were brought towards that kind of disciplinary process is, is not for any of us to kind of comment on. It's you in that situation or the tribunal courts or whatever. Maybe we need to get a HR person on to talk about this. That'd be quite interesting, actually. So I kind of wanted to just make it very clear that it exists, whether we like it or not. Accountability and culpability exist, right? And this is why I've touched on the platitudes a few times. This is why I get just as frustrated with kind of let's just put it into a bracket and call it the new view community or let's say the new view kind of extremists. When they go around saying platitudes like no blame, we're a no blame company. Like, yeah, that feels good. I get that. Yes, I get the notion behind it, the kind of high end aspiration, so to speak. But ultimately, I think that it's as stupid and as dangerous as walking around saying we're going to do zero harm. I think no blame for me is just the new view version of zero harm. They're both stupid. They both have no logic assigned to them whatsoever you know i acknowledge that blame has a kind of trade-off to learn in 100 percent, and we'll talk about that in a minute but ultimately i don't think it's possible and that's our argument for not having zero harm therefore i think it's just as stupid so if you're going around demonizing zero harm and then you're also saying we're a no blame organization then in my opinion you're, you're part of the problem um that's I might be wrong there. Maybe you disagree. Let's have a chat. You know, but share the podcast on LinkedIn because you're angry with me, and that helps me anyway. And um, and we can discuss. But ultimately, I do think that no blame is just one really good example of a new view platitude that it's just making us look really, really bad. And I don't think it's ultimately helpful. So blame exists. Blame exists in law. Exists in your contract. And you can avoid it. It does exist. But when we're talking about blame, I actually like to use, as I've kind of used a couple of times in here, accountability and culpability. And I actually got this from a gentleman called Shane Bush. When I was on some training uh, delivered by Paradigm, which, very good point, for us to insert the Paradigm advert, which will go... 321 now. Just a quick shout out to Paradigm Human Performance, uh, human organizational performance experts. These guys work around the world with some amazing brands doing some amazing work with their amazing team. So if you're in a position within your workplace where you're trying to onboard some of the hot principles, human organizational performance principles and practices and tools, then these are the specialists can help you out with that. 
100%. Whether you want to train up some practitioners, whether you want to work with the shop floor, or whether you want to work with the blunt end and the leadership as well, they have the solutions for you. And also don't forget to check out the Learning Organization webinar, which they run, which is an outstanding resource of amazing conversations. And they built a lovely little community there as well. So don't forget to sign up to that every other Thursday. So when I was on that training with Paradigm, I asked Shane this exact question. So Shane runs like a, kind of like an introduction to hop within the wider hop practitioner training that Paradigm run. And I actually thought that Shane's session was probably the best bit for me personally. Um, it was really good to get his kind of opinion on stuff. And we ended up having a discussion around blame. I asked him the question and he said, when we're talking about blame, we need to put it in the context of two words, accountability and culpability. So if we were to Google those and get the definition, which is exactly what I've done, accountability is a fact or condition of being accountable, e.g. responsible. And culpability is a responsibility for a fault or wrong, e.g. blame right so accountability is essentially being held accountable is to be to give an account for what happened is to say i screwed up i gave the wrong medication i fell asleep whatever right it might also be held accountable for something you see that you're not involved in but ultimately it's being accountable for your own acts and omissions which comes back to section seven of the health and safety at work act right culpability is essentially being responsible for not doing what you should have done so that's where the blame piece comes in right held accountable and culpability from culpability for me uh, are kind of the same thing but I'm, I'm, I'm definitely no um i don't know what would you call that literacy genius or whatever so with culpability and accountability then, we, we obviously have the enforcer and the legal professions that can hold someone to account and then ultimately find them culpable in the courts, right? We also have HR department and operational management, senior management that would be able to find you accountable and essentially culpable within the workplace contracts and disciplinary procedures, be that for safety relations or not, right? So again, we come back to the point, which I'll finally nail down, it does exist. Additionally though, and this is what we tried to bring out in the flowchart that we offered as a free download from riskfluentlimited.com. If you want to download it and have a look at it, then uh, that we'll put it in the description below. But we kind of added kind of a third ver or a second version of accountability. Let's say third, you've got like legal accountability, internal kind of contractual accountability and then there was kind of like i don't know like this personal accountability is probably the best way to describe it um in that we've kind of we've kind of portrayed that as like internally somebody screwing up right and then saying oh that's my bad you know i did this it's that, that kind of personal accountability right and i um, we put in that 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 flow chart that that heavily dependent on the psychological safety within the company e.g you feeling safe to say i screwed up and then offer your your feedback and your insight into what happened in that moment now anyone that's into all of this kind of human organization performance high reliability learning organizations will say that that's what we're looking for, right? Is that moment with that person that was in the moment and says, this is exactly what I experienced because that's the gold dust. That's the bit of information that we're really, really, really trying to get to. So to have that, we need to be able to make them feel safe to take on that personal accountability to then tell us what happened in that moment because they're the moments that we'll never see. Only that person can see that. Only that person can feel that, hear that whatever right so this is where this is where i think we start to get really messy with this stuff and this is where i think the problem comes in so that's the driver the operator the nurse turning around and saying i screwed up i feel safe to say i screwed up and this is why i think i screwed up so we can learn from that but you're not going to do that if you think that you're going to get prosecuted for that right and no one's going to do that or, or you might, I don't know, it depends how kind of selfless you are, I suppose. But but ultimately, there's going to be this thing in you that says, hang on a minute, if I own up to this, 
I could go to jail. I could lose my job. I could, what, there's repercussions to that, right? So it kind of comes back to a conversation that me and Sherry have had in the household for like so many times in that there's freedom to choose what you do. 100 percent there's always freedom to choose and i think that's kind of what accountability is um is that freedom to choose but also accepting the consequences of each choice be that good or bad um so you can't just accept the good and not the bad if you make a choice there will be consequences of that and that's kind of freedom of choice that we have but ultimately the accountability is being able to accept their consequences to it so there's this kind of personal accountability that we're trying to develop through psychological safety within the workplace so we've got this we've got this legal accountability and culpability we've got this contractual accountability and culpability then we've got this personal thing that this is where your no blame stuff comes in right because you feel like you can't blame because if i start blaming people and they see that they could get blamed then they're not going to tell me and this is really prevalent in these two cases right in that we can see from let me get my notes up there's a lady called Janie Harvey Garner who's a founder of something called show me your stethoscope a nursing group on Facebook with more than 600,000 members and she actually said off the back of this case uh, in America healthcare just changed forever she said after the verdict you can no longer trust people to tell the truth because they'll be incriminating themselves And then again, from a patient safety expert called Bruce Lambert, in an interview before the verdict, he said that it was extremely concerning that Vought was being criminally prosecuted for the medical error. And then it says in quotes, this will not only cause nurses and doctors to not report medication errors, it will cause nurses to leave the profession. So, there is... The best way I think we need to deal with this, right, is that, as we've acknowledged, blame exists. And sometimes we have to move forward with that. But we move forward with it with an understanding that there's a trade-off. And I think that's the only way we can deal with this, is that it exists, but when we do it, when we move forward, right, we have that freedom of choice to move forward with blame, but it comes with consequences. And the consequences are that it will chip away at psychological safety. So it will start to impact the culture within your organisation. So then we come back to the video that we did in cult- on culture and YouTube, right, off the back of Carsten Bush's book. And this is why I think all of this stuff is so freaking awesome when it starts to work together, in that culture, as I like to kind of use Dave Snowden's definition is a product of our interactions over time so your interactions could be with processes with procedures with people with managers with meetings and posters could be absolutely everything with the enforcer with the new all of this stuff is impacting your culture so everything that happens in your life and in your organization is a vote towards the culture that you're going to get in the future right so if you blame someone that's a vote to have less psychological safety within your culture so you can move forward with it 100 percent. you can move forward with it but the, co- the the consequence of that is that it will chip away at your psychological safety so you need to make sure you're doing other stuff elsewhere that has more votes to increase your psychological safety because you know you're doing one or two things that are voting against that right so it's this kind of it's this kind of constant trade-off and balancing thing right and weirdly as i was writing these notes there was one thing that came to mind as i was doing this so recently i've been playing a game and it reminded me of of something in the game all of this they're writing the notes thinking about the trade-offs of blame and that you know if we do this and we reduce our, our psychological safety but we improve this right so i've been playing this game lately called uh, total war warhammer 2 right so basically you'll probably know what warhammer is it's like this world of elves and shit like that right and total war is like a massive kind of empire building strategy game it's like a over complicated game of chess right and you have to build cities and armies and essentially conquer the world right that's ultimately the aim 
within this though there is politics there is the the actual battles but there is also your cities and in your cities you have things like public order corruption and things like that right and sometimes you get these things come up like it might say um this person has been or let's say this group of people have been found in your province right you could take them on board and your reduction cost, your your uh, price of, of hiring army or personnel will reduce by 25%, all right? So it'd be cheaper for you to recruit army people, yeah? But your public order um, will be impacted negatively by 10%. So if we think about that in this context, right? is that imagine you've got like this this like dashboard for your company and it says psychological safety currently sitting nice at plus 20 percent right but oh, right we're gonna need to we're gonna need to fire bob right because he's done this so many times and it's fair and it's just that we fire bob right but we realize that firing bob is going to have a positive impact on x but it's going to have a negative impact by minus 10 percent on our psychological safety so we know that we're going to go from positive 20 percent on psychological safety down to positive 10 percent so we need to do something elsewhere to offset that and bring it back up right so the workplace is kind of like this game in the there are trade-offs and votes that happen everywhere and every decision we make has pluses and minuses has positives and negatives so it's not having one or the other. It's not having zero harm or zero blame. It's having harm and blame and realizing that when those things happen, they have impacts within the organization and we need to trade off on those. We need to make decisions. It's the same as efficiency and resilience. You can't have one without the other, but you can't have just one because if you're just efficient, you're not resilient. If you're just resilient, you're not efficient. And then you're going to go out of business. So it's the same thing. It's not no blame or blame. It's sometimes there's blame and sometimes there isn't. And sometimes you fuck up so bad that the legal profession is going to get involved and you're going to have to be blamed. And that's just how it is. And then that's going to have an impact on your culture. So it's not about fighting the thing that exists that you cannot fight. It's about dealing with the the trade-off or the negative impact of that elsewhere or building the capacity within that psychological safety for example that you can deal with something like this having such a psychological psychologically safe environment that you can have a blame case within your organization you can have this stuff on the news within your industry and still move on as a company so I think it's really important to remember that we're not saying it's one without the other. And I don't think it ever has. I don't think just culture has never said that. It's always said, in my opinion, that it's just culture. It's justice, right? So it's fair and just to blame. You know, ultimately, if you follow that old um, just culture, like it comes down to essentially finding some culpability. But you go through the process first, you go through substitution, you go through intention, you go through, you know, the context, the go through the contributing factors. And and that's why we felt our flowchart just needed to, we needed something to elaborate on it. And we made it for ourselves and then we thought, hey, you know, let's just give it away and, and see if it helps other people. Um, but ultimately, it's never said no blame, it said just blame. But there is one last final thing that I think we need to acknowledge in this. I think we need to acknowledge that particularly in really big harrowing cases like this, I think Grenfell is something that's really prominent. Um, and I think Jill probably says everything that I've said in this in such a better, more concise way when I spoke to her on the podcast as well. But ultimately, there are people in this. There are family members in this, and therefore there are emotions in this. And again, it's not about removing emotion. It's about acknowledging the emotion because it is emotional, right? Listen back to this podcast like two years ago and listen to how emotional I was around fire. Like I was just angry for years. And I listen back to that sometimes and it's a bit cringe for me, but ultimately it's because there was, there was, emotion involved and there is in this i mean the words of the family that have lost their loved ones in a tram crash 
really show that. You know, they say that they'll be in the courtroom however long this takes. They'll be there every step of the way. It's justice for their loved ones. Um, and they, they therefore don't feel like their lives are lost for nothing um, if they've found accountability, essentially. You know, they're saying it's been a long time coming, but this is a step in the right direction that they're now prosecuting the company and the driver and so on. So essentially, there is emotion to this. And I actually put a post out touching on this um, on LinkedIn, like last year. And I was sitting on a Sunday morning and but I was essentially watching um, my TV show that I was into at that time, which was His Dark Material, to see a series on BBC, right? It's an, an adaption from Philip Pullman's book. And there was such a great interaction between uh, two slash three characters um, within the scene. Um, essentially, a lady called Ma Costa um, was was angry. She was emotional. Her eldest son had gone missing. And whilst looking for their eldest son, her youngest son has gone missing or vice versa. Marcos is essentially like pacing up and down and there's the leader of this um, this group called Fada Calder and he's talking to the main protagonist which is called Lyra who had known where the missing child had gone um, whilst they were looking for the other missing child and and as he was trying to ask Lyra what had happened and where the boy had gone, Mark Costa, who's the mother of these two boys now that have gone missing, was sort of pacing up and down, angry. You know, the, the, the actor was really portraying the emotion. And she loudly says, if I find out that you had anything to do with this, e.g. alluding to the fact that Fa, Father Col Calder had sent off the older boy to go and look for um, the younger boy, and Calder interrupted her and he said, blame will help no one now. And she shouted her response, said, it will help me. It will help me. And I thought that was such a powerful scene, but really helpful to us. You know, we can spend so long reading books from academics and, and papers and listening to them and so on. And that's ultimately really helpful. But sometimes some of the best stories can really help us. Um, and this scene really told that really told us that blame is an emotional response, right? And I think it was Jim Reason that said blame is, is like a drug we're addicted to or something like that, you know? But ultimately, I said in the post that it has no place in learning from events, and I, I'm not sure I would put it like that now. I'd probably say that it doesn't help us when we're learning from events, but, but ultimately it is part of us, so it does have a place. It's kind of like a contributory factor to why we might not learn. You know, it's emotion versus learning. It's that balancing um, act that we need to do, that sometimes we need to let the emotion go and let that do what it needs to do, because if we don't, then we'll never get time to come um, back to it and, and learn, right? So it's not one or the other. It's both balancing all the time. So it does have a place within us being human, but essentially it's not helpful towards learning. So essentially you allow that emotion to enter you, you acknowledge it, and you put it to one side to then focus on learning and improving, right? Kind of like mindfulness practice, you know, kind of hello fox and, you know, hello pain, acknowledge it, deal with it, move on, right? It's there, you can't do anything about it. So essentially what we spoke around this whole time is that Blame does exist, it definitely exists legally, it definitely exists contractually, and it definitely exists emotionally. Um, we're trying to build some personal accountability in our workplace, we're trying to build some psychological safety, and we need to do things that vote towards the improvement of psychological safety. Treat it like that game that I was on about, you, some things you do increase it, some things you do decrease it, and you need to build up that capacity to have as much built up as positive psychological safety, positive culture, whatever you want to call it, within your workplace to deal with these bad cases because sometimes they do exist and they do show up. So ultimately, that's our first Rebound and Safety React. We've used these two stories to talk about blame uh, in the workplace and organisational learning to frame uh, a little bit more context to our flowchart, which you can download from Risk Fluent limited.com uh, links to that will be in the description below we'll put some notes uh, from my show notes into the show notes below as well so that you can go and check out some, some more check the sources obviously linkedin is really good for the following sources so go back if you want to look into this more 
go back to the the original sources uh, of this as well but ultimately i hope you've enjoyed this we'll do this a little bit more we're going to think think about the next month's uh, react we'll keep an eye on what's going on out there but if you see something, whether it's old, new, or whatever, it really doesn't matter, that you'd like to hear us react to, whether you want us to watch something and then come back to it, happy to do that. Whatever it is that you would like us to react to, send it to me, James McPherson on LinkedIn, or email me, james at rebrandingsafety.com. Say, James, this is something I want you to react to. Don't forget to download the, um, don't forget to download the, what's it called, the flowchart as well don't forget to check out project Miletium as well which is our professional development membership which you can go to we have loads of conversations like this all the time um twice a week we have conversations like this nearly nearly every 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 week if that makes sense sometimes we talk about other stuff as well but so much of our time is spent just chewing through this stuff and learning so if you really enjoy this type of conversation then please check out project Miletium. first month is free uh, right now so you can join don't like it you can bugger off and not not lose any money so that's good we also run some events we just had one this weekend um so we've run a quarterly event we run a philosophy call which are even more mind-blowing than stuff like this so there's loads if you enjoy rebranding safety trust me you will enjoy project Miletium. website to join in the description below don't forget to check out paradigm as well all their details in the description Hello. Thank you very much for listening to our first segment of Rebound and Safety Reacts. Let us know what you thought of it on social media, of which all of the links for that are in the description below. I'll catch you next week. Safe. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the host and its guests and do not necessarily reflect the position of the companies. Examples of analysis discussed within this podcast are examples only based on limited and dated open source information and should not be utilised in real life as the only solution available. Assumptions made within this analysis are not reflective of the position of the companies. No part of this podcast may be reproduced, stored or transmitted in any form or by any means, mechanical, electronic or otherwise, without prior written permission from James McPherson.